The Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings, alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu, like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway, noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's. Hey, greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit. It's time for another episode of The Week That Was for May 21st of 2021, a special outdoor edition, at least for me today. Decided to take the studio outside and hopefully, hopefully we won't have any chainsaws or weed whackers going in the background but we shall see. Anyway, thanks for being here. We certainly do appreciate it. I would like to welcome my panelists as well. As usual, I have Nancy Derringer of Deadline Detroit. Hello, Nancy. Hey. Also, Alan Langell, editor and co-founder of Deadline with us once again. Hello, hello. Attorney Steve Fishman returns. We appreciate it, sir. Lawyer, lawyer Steve Fishman, forgive me. Yeah, God forbid. Don't call me an attorney. <laughs> and longtime, longtime journalist and uh, and now, of course, PR guy for Wayne State, Daryl Dossey is with us. Hello, Daryl. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a little while. And, uh, you know, OK, we've got a lot of big stuff to talk about this week. And, and normally we do schmuck of the week at the end of the program. But I had so many nominees this week. There's one that I wanted to get out there first. And just just to get the conversation going here. And it's everybody involved in what is going on in this recount audit in Arizona, in Maricopa County, because I have to I have to tell you about something that I actually read about one of the conspiracy theories floating around about what happened out there to these so-called missing Trump ballots, because this is just too good. And people are actually talking about this as if it's a real thing. So apparently they took a bunch of ballots that were for Trump. They shredded them and not they didn't just throw them away. No, no. They then took the shredded ballots, fed them to chickens. The chickens ate the ballots, and then they incinerated the chickens to get rid of the evidence. Do chickens eat shredded paper? I don't know, but the question <laughs> is, I mean, what's the point of the middleman step? <laughs> yeah, why, 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 just, the poor why wouldn't you just burn the shredded ballots? Because that seems to it would be do, it would do the same thing. But I mean, no, you got to throw in some animal torture, I guess, <laughs> just to make it a, a really good conspiracy theory. Little well, bits of bamboo, sprinkle some bamboo, and well, it, well, exactly, yeah. exactly, because you know, you know, hey. Maybe that's like some new dish that we're not sure of. Chicken a la orange or something like that. Chinese chicken, say, orange though, chicken, something. Because the bamboo to, paper, that's right. I have to say, though, I'm, we're all laughing because it's funny, because it's ridiculous. It's, but it's not funny. It's scary. The things that I have read, exactly. The things that I have read in the last few days have convinced me that all of this stuff, I mean, we're going to see another Capitol riot. Only it's going to be worse next time. I mean, we're going to see more violence connected with this we're going to see um we're going to i mean the 2024 election is going to absolutely be another shit show only a shit show times a thousand you know the last times the last shit show that we have it's going to be really really bad and this is what they want this is what the republicans are planning for they are they have fully embraced this sort of Bullshit fascism. So I think well, 2022 is going to be a run up to that. That's going to be the, that's going to yeah, be. Yeah, we'll see what happens in 2022. So, but I, I bring this up just to sort of set the table over over what we've been witnessing over these past several months when it comes to these stop the steal movement, the January 6th insurrection, and, and the fact that we now have. Well, one, basically one political party that's just trying to make it all go away. And, you know, we shouldn't even bother looking into this. Uh, 35 House Republicans did go along with the Democrats to authorize uh, a commission to actually look into what happened on January 6th, the roots of it, who is responsible. Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy both signaling that they are not in favor of this. They don't want to go forward. And the reasons that they are suggesting that they shouldn't go forward with this are like you know these minor technicalities saying well it's got to be done by this date rather than actually digging and finding the truth they want it to just go away because they don't want it to be an election issue next year and and they one of the senators actually came out and said it and i'm, I'm going to forget his name but he said look this is just going to make us look bad as republicans no shit well, i think i, I think <laughs> what it, one of, the things, one, one, of, one of the things that I think is, may come out and, and should come out is is what role some of these uh, right wing Congress members played in, in helping them out. And I think that's crucial 
that that comes out. If anything else, I mean, yeah, the FBI, whatever, uh, can continue to investigate the Justice Department. But I, I, I wonder how much they were, are going to bother to go after the congressional members. And, and somebody has to expose what they did. I mean, we've already seen tons of evidence. We've seen pictures of these folks with the insurrectionists. There was just that deleted video of Marjorie Taylor Greene acting a fool in front of uh, <laughs> Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's you know, mail drop slot. Uh, and she was there with people who were later identified as being insurrectionists. You've got you know, all of these folks now going on record as trying to downplay what happened on January 6th. One guy saying it was nothing but a a, you know, a normal tourist visit. I don't know. What, <laughs> hey, there's know, a picture of him I, barricading the door. Business. I've never smeared, you know, feces and urine all over the place. <laughs> you know, when, you know I, I don't know, maybe at the Marriott one thing. But, but, but my, <laughs> my, my point, my point is, you know, I mean, you know, obviously, not only are they engaged in efforts to try and institutionalize some of this thinking, but they're also trying to mind wipe us at the same time, trying to convince us that what we saw is not what we actually saw. Who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? Right. right. You know, we you know, need to hit the poop and pee angle harder when we talk about this thing, because I think that does more to discuss normal, you know, regular normal people than the idea of, you know, taking, putting your feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk. It's well, like the, con- the congressman the and pooping in the hall. The congressman who made the statement that it seemed like a normal tourist visit, there are pictures of him actually helping to barricade the doors to the House chamber mm-hmm. for fear of what was going on outside the door. And, <laughs> and I mean, I, I'm sorry. That's not how I treat my guests. <laughs> I'm not barricading the door as you're walking up to the front. You know, and, and, and I'm sitting there, I, I'm just looking at this attempt and it's it's really, really frustrating. And the fact they don't even want to look into it because they said, well, we're not really going to learn anything new. These are the same people that had 33 hearings on Benghazi, yeah. 33 hearings on Benghazi, and they're not willing to have one to look into an insurrection at our own capital. That tells you all you need to know about what they're afraid of, because look, yes, it is going to make them look bad, but you did that yourself. Sometimes... You just got to take the fact that you are an idiot and just say, yep, we were idiots. We allowed this to happen and we encouraged it and we were wrong. Somebody's going to have to take it. I mean, you had people tweeting Nancy Pelosi's location while she was moving throughout the Capitol. You know, these these are the kinds of things they don't really want you to know. You know, it's more than just Josh Hawley putting up a fist. I mean, which, you know, which is bad enough, throwing up the fist of support. But these people actually, there's evidence that suggests these people actually coordinated with these insurrectionists. Oh, Folks, well. Robert, yeah. yeah. You know? And I want to know what happened on that phone call uh, between the Speaker of the House and the President that day. Um, Ooh, that's going to yeah. be interesting. And, yeah. and that's why he doesn't want to do this, because he doesn't want to get subpoenaed. Because, you know, I'm sorry, but if you avoid a subpoena, you look bad. You, you just look like you're guilty, that maybe you've got something to hide. and that Maybe that's not I, fair, <laughs> but it certainly appears that way, Steve. I'll I mean, you know, I, 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 well, that's what they're going to have to do in some of these cases. <laughs> Well, when, when, when you say avoid a subpoena, you know, th- th- there's the only way you can avoid a subpoena is to challenge a subpoena in court. Yeah. You can't just ignore subpoenas, at least not with a regular Justice Department or regular administration, because you're subpoenaed and you have to appear. And judges, 99.9 percent of them, you don't appear. Fine. The marshals will come get you and then you'll be here. But you'll come from the back instead of from the front. I so think when people we start need- talking about avoiding subpoenas, it kind of makes me laugh. You can, you know, I mean, I've challenged a subpoena or two in my career as the lawyer because a client comes and blah, 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 blah. But this business about avoiding subpoenas by you're just not going to show up. Well, it depends on who's in charge. I think I, I would like to see people subpoenaed who were in the White House when Trump was watching the insurrection on TV and see what was happening. Because first of all, he helped instigate the whole thing, and then he had the capability of stopping it by making an announcement, by sending in more support or whatever. He did none of that for hours. And I'd like to hear what those people who were there with him in the White House have to say. Well, and wasn't just, there wasn't there a story yeah. in the paper just this week? I think it was the Times had a story that basically said that Trump was in there like cheering this on and couldn't understand why nobody else was as happy as he was that right. this was going on. Everybody else in there is horrified and saying, I think this went a little too far. And Trump's like, well, this is great. How come you guys don't like this? And I, mean, um, I want to know, know what Michael Flynn's brother knows. 
officers. You know, I want to know what people who are in the room who heard the call for help for the National Guard and, you know, for folks to come out and support those. I mean, they let those officers sit out there and face those insurrections on their own. If we, if it comes to find out that they did not respond, they intentionally withheld support, that, that to me is liable for the murder of people like Officer Sicknick as, 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 as anybody else because Obstruction. they had, asked you to help and they refused. Obstruction of justice. Absolutely. Well, you know, what's interesting is even if these hearings don't go forward and, and we don't have congressional hearings about this, we are still going to have the trials of the people that participated in this that will keep this in the news for a little while. And I bring this up for a reason, uh, because we're starting to see the defense um, that is shaping up around this. And a term that has been used by a couple of attorneys here is something they're calling foxitis, basically suggesting that these people have been brainwashed by Fox News and the president. Um, and and that's what's responsible for this. Now, I want to read a quote from the attorney uh, for uh, the QAnon shaman. And, and like I said, this is not my wording here, everybody. I just want you to know this. But Jacob Chansley is the guy who was in the Capitol with the horns, the so-called Q shaman. Uh, his attorney, a guy named Watkins, said that his client had Asperger's. And here's the quote. He said, quote, a lot of these defendants, and I'm going to use this colloquial term, perhaps disrespectfully, but they're all fucking short bus people. These are people with brain damage. They're fucking retarded. They're on a goddamn spectrum. But they're our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our coworkers. They're part of our country. These aren't bad people. They don't have prior criminal history. Fuck, they were subjected to four plus years of goddamn propaganda, the likes of which the world has not seen since fucking Hitler. Wow. That is the attorney for the <clears throat> shaman. Yeah. And I mean, this is what the defense is going to be, I think, is that, you know, look, these people you know, were told to do this by their president. Take away the slurs. And that's actually a refreshing point of view. You know, <laughs> I mean, it really is. I mean, at least he's speaking the truth. I mean, you know, it's just, he's you know, I mean, I I, th I don't approve of him using words like retarded or anything no, else. No. Short bus people. I mean, but at least I mean, at least he is saying that the last four years of constant propaganda have a certain effect on a certain kind of person. Um, did you see the, it, it was going around during my dead of night, Twitter, you know, meanderings of that woman from, I believe it's OAN news, Chanel, what's yeah, her yeah, face yeah. interviewing Trump in, and she, her first question is we're now five months into what many Americans see as the illegitimate Joe Biden presidency. <laughs> and I mean, it's just like, but there are people who look at that and they don't see like, look at these shitty production values. Look at this, you know, idiot. Look at this other thing that's bad. I mean, they look at that and they see there's a woman talking on a screen. So that means that she must know what she's talking about because somebody gave her a job to do it. And look, listen to what she's saying. I mean, they, and then they want to believe it anyway. So there you go. Here's the thing. Well, Here's the thing that gets me. First of all, they're real quick to make up all kinds of new diseases for white people whenever they get <laughs> I'm, I'm so sick of all the new diseases. Influenza, <laughs> foxitis, yes. Yeah, influenza. I forgot about that one. Nobody ever, you know, I, I, you know, I, I you know, I, I never get black itis, so you know, you know <laughs> something happens to me. You know, nobody. Gets, so, so you know, it's, it's, it's I'm, first of all, let's, let's, you know, throw all that nonsense out of the way. I mean, I don't, I don't think that that, that kind of nonsense is going, to, is going to stand up. I agree with Nancy. I mean, it does, it, it is refreshing in the sense that it finally does speak to the kind of, you know, gaslighting that our nation is undergoing, the, the misinformation campaign that we've been besieged with for the last several years. Um, but, you know, I also think though that, I, I think that, you know, I think that, 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 that there is, there is this, 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 unwillingness by by huge sections of this country, including liberal parts, to see these people as what they are. They're terrorists, they're traitors, they're insurrectionists, they will kill me, they will kill you, they, they will, they, this is who these, they showed up with zip ties, you know, they were ready to do serious damage. I mean, I've listened to Malcolm, uh, 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 the fellow on MSNBC, I forget his name right now, he's the, he's the, uh, special forces uh, expert. But, I mean, you know, he, he, he's talked a lot about, you know, about these folks being prepared to do real damage. And, it's, you know, I think it's on one hand, Nancy, you know, I think it's right. But on the other hand, I think it also really diminishes what these folks are and who these folks are. These people are anti-American. They are a hostile force calling from with the call is coming from inside the house with these people. And that's the real 
danger. You know, this this is not about somebody parachuting in like Red Dawn or whatever to take over <laughs> the United States. This is about, you know, well-trained, well-coordinated, well-financed yahoos who are serious about it. Let's think about what they did. They wanted to overthrow a legitimate election and install a fascist dictatorship. This is white, what they're trying to do. Call it so White Dawn. I have a question. White Dawn. White Dawn. That's <laughs> good. I like that. No, so I, I, I have a ask question Steve for Hill. Steve. Yeah, yeah I was going to say what Steve, Steve thinks about that kind of defense. Well, I was about I was waiting for Daryl to finish. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry no, to interrupt. No, no, quite quite frankly, what what that really is, it's it's really important for people to understand that because what Daryl's saying is absolutely true. I don't care what you call all these so-called diseases that these white folk have who do crazy things. Those are not things that are recognized by the law or by the legal system. So. What that lawyer is really saying and what some of the other lawyers are really saying, what they're trying to do is they're hoping like hell they can get a hung jury. It's going to be jury nullification, which they're not permitted to argue. They can't argue, look, I don't care what the law is. You should find them not guilty. What they're hoping is if you have 12 jurors, you'll have two or three who either are those kind of people to begin with or somehow ignore what Daryl is saying, the fact that they're traitors and that they're terrorists and that they'll feel sorry for them somehow. That's all they're really trying to do. More importantly, what's really coming out in these cases, and you guys got to remember, I've told you this from the beginning. These are long processes when you start going to federal court. Number one, the FBI takes their time, which they should, to make sure they have the evidence in place and the witnesses in place. Number two, the system, particularly during COVID, is moving slowly, okay? What you're going to see, my guess is, I don't know about the shaman, or, but some of these other guys, and a lot of them, they're going to testify against other people. Now, whether they can get to Trump, of course, they can't because they're just some nobodies that follow the guy's lead. But they're going to bring, I absolutely agree, we have plenty of evidence that shows this was well-financed, this was well-organized. These defendants, when they're facing federal time, for sure, by the way, this isn't going to be like going to state court in Mississippi. We're all so uh, much so you killed the brother. We'll give you two years probation. Yeah. It's not going to be like that. So what that guy, that lawyer is probably doing, I'm not sure why he needed to say fuck so many times, but what he's probably doing is he's trying to lay the groundswell, you know, lay the groundwork for somehow making a plea deal and keeping the guy from getting 60 months, maybe he'll only get 24 because he'll come in and he'll help against them. That's what's going to happen as time goes on. And we all have to be patient and watch how the system works. So. Well, like I said, I, I think the one thing that comes out of this, too, is it does keep this in the public's eye uh, for a lot longer because these trials are going to be going on. And, you know, we're going to start seeing those. And and hopefully there will be some decent coverage of these so we can see what kind of penalties these people actually get for what they tried to do on January 6th. Um, you know, President Trump obviously watching this very carefully. But while we're talking courts, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the other legal problems that he's dealing with right now? Uh, you had an announcement um from prosecutors in New York that this is not just a civil investigation. This is now a criminal investigation into the Trump organization in New York. And, and I'm not sure exactly why you would come out and make that statement unless you're trying to shake the tree and maybe get some people to get scared and cooperate a little bit. But um, it's still pretty significant. And it tells me that what we've been talking about for the last year or so on this program, that Trump was going to be facing some significant legal challenges when he left office. It looks like that is indeed coming to fruition. Well, if you want from the lawyer's perspective, OK, it, it is highly unusual, uh, in my view, for anybody to make an announcement like that. And I think it's sensible to think that they're doing that to shake the tree a little bit, perhaps to try to scare that guy. I think his last name is Weisselberger, the guy who seems to know everything about what goes on with Trump. CEO, yeah. CFO of the world, I believe, is what uh, one of the Trump family called him. Yeah. So, so that, that part is unusual. But. I think I've said this to a few people since this announcement came out. Anybody that sits and thinks that an attorney general, a state attorney general, is investigating a case and it's only going to be civil, there's no way it's going to be criminal, they'd have to have lived in a closet for the last five, 50 years. Because obviously that's what attorneys general do. They investigate criminal activity. Something can start. You guys have to remember this. You can have an IRS audit, any of us, right? And it's a it's just a civil proceeding at that time. It's done by the IRS uh, regular agents. But while the audit's going on, they discover that one of us did whatever it is that happens to be criminal. It immediately can just get referred to the CID. 
the Criminal Investigations Division, and it becomes criminal. So there's there's nothing mysterious about this. We've all known. We've talked about it on the show for a couple of years. And you know what I say, Donald Trump is a career criminal, right? <laughs> you got the career of criminal's brain, and his organization is a criminal organization. And Michael Cohen, as tainted as he might be, has made it very clear, and he was in the middle of all of it. And he's obviously got the criminal mind himself, but a lot of times that's what criminals do. They surround themselves with other crooks. Why would you want a square working for you if you're a crook? Right. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting in Florida that they're trying to block any extradition, although Trump's in New Jersey now. But, I mean, I don't even know if that's uh, – and maybe can you, you can that? explain yeah. that. Well, I, 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 I was reading. Kind of, I know they can't do that. Like the Supreme Court ruled a long, long, long time ago. To, but, but, like, I wanted them to try to try. Like, I really <laughs> was looking forward to, like, you know, because I know some dudes who, like, in the Navy SEALs. And, you know, I was – I'm really looking forward to them going down – to face off against like these old dudes in like the Florida National Guard or whatever, you know, like or Ron DeSantis like security team. I, you know, I mean, there's no way that's going to fly. But I was really hoping they would. I'm, I'm, I'm watching Narcos. Ride. I'm watching Narcos, and you know, the first three, two seasons or whatever, Pablo Escobar is doing everything to make sure he doesn't get extradited. He kills half the Supreme Court. He blows up an airplane. He's doing everything, and it's like. It's Pablo Trump, you know. <laughs> and he still died on the rooftop with, like, not his face. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. It, exactly. It, it wasn't like he wound up in a great place. Right. Yeah, right. Well, you know, I, I don't I, – I, I just – the idea of watching him sweat for a little while over this is, is, is bringing just, a little bit of joy to my life. I, I feel I just, like right when, after, he, after the election, I said, okay, let him go away. I don't care if he gets indicted. But what he Not did, anymore after the election was so criminal and continues to be criminal and with the insurrection and, and the lies about the election, he deserves some type of prison time. You can't. I just want well, to Nancy, say, Nancy, then Daryl. OK, I just want to say that I think it's hilarious that the person that they appear that the attorney general apparently got a, a lot of this information from was the ex-wife of Weiselberg's son. Which just goes to show you, it's like Cherche La Femme. You know, we, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we rule the world. Anyway, go ahead, Daryl. Sorry. I was just going to say, we're watching, we're watching people being executed <clears throat> all over this country for, you know, a, an outstanding warrant, for a traffic ticket, for walking, you know, through a store, for calling the police, you know, in, in, in need of help. Um, you know, for sitting down next to an autistic person who's having an episode. I mean, we're watching people being shot, being killed over these kinds of things by law enforcement. You cannot, you know, live in a country where that kind of thing is happening and then think you're going to tell me that Donald Trump just gets to walk away from this stuff or any of these folks get to walk away. I mean, you know, that is the exact wrong message at a time when you, you, you're supposed to be trying to engender more trust in law enforcement and in the system and all these sorts of things. You know, everybody's ballyhooing about, you know, what happened with George Floyd, you know, with Derek Chauvin being convicted, which was, you know, it was just fair. I mean, it's, you know, I, I'd hate to have to get, get on the rooftop every time and wave a flag because fairness happens, because justice happens. But, you know, this is where we are. And so, you know, I feel like it's even more important that these people are held accountable, that, that, that their transgressions are brought to light, because we're living in a time when people are telling me it's OK to shoot me over a, a busted tail, a busted tail line. Well, let's 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 talk about this. We had two cases this week that are, that are in the news. Um, one was, of course, uh, uh, th this Ronald Green tape out of Louisiana is is really really awful. Um, you have a situation where the guy was fleeing from the police. They catch up to him. They end up tasing him several times, uh, leaving him in the prone position. He ends up dying. The original story that the cops told the family was that he got into an accident and that's why he died. It hit a tree. Hit a tree. Did not happen. And then they said, oh, well, there was an incident later. Didn't happen. They lied twice. Now the tape comes out and the attorney general in Louisiana and the police chief uh, the, of the Louisiana State Police are upset because the video was leaked illegally. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what your concern is right now? Mm -hmm. And I mean, this was is blatant. Uh, uh, it was a horrible, horrible tape. And it's just it's indicative of a lot of this crap that we've been talking about for so long. And, and you know, people have been screaming from the rooftops forever that it goes on. But we were always in denial. No, the police are the good guys. This was awful. Dragging him around by his feet when he was chained. I mean, you know, and then lying about it. 
I, I just, I, I well, can't, I, 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 I mean, think, I do, the outrage is just so palpable and it's just, it deserves, these guys deserve everything that's coming their way. I, I think what, what, what we're seeing though, is really what a lot of us were saying. All right, Chauvin was convicted, which was a, a great thing, no doubt. But look at the strength of that case. You know, I, you guys asked me about it as it was proceeding. You, just the video, you, if you have everybody was mute, the video convicts them on its own, right? So now you're in Louisiana, which obviously is still living in 1952 or 1852, maybe. They are complaining about the fact that the tape is released it somehow it violated some rule when we all know what they're complaining about is that what we saw is Derek Chauvin, these guys. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same exact mentality. And again, I've said this on the show before. If you have the mentality of police officers, that you have the right to use the kind of force they've been using on black people, I'm sure they're doing it on white people, too, but not as much. But for the kinds of things they're stopping them for, think about it. The guy fled from the police. OK, now he's stopped. Now they've got him. He doesn't have a weapon. There's a bunch of them. So you start kicking his ass. Basically, why? We won't say the word, but Daryl knows what word the guy was saying. You you think you can flee from us? Boom, we'll show you. And that's exactly what goes on. It's the mentality, Craig, it's the mentality of police officers. What needs to change in this country is the entire concept of what policing is. You cannot have police officers who think their job is to just beat the shit out of everybody, particularly those of a different ethnicity or color of them. That's the problem. Well, we also had the uh, the decision, you know, uh, by the uh, district attorney in Elizabeth City, New Jersey or uh, North Carolina, excuse me, to suggest that, um, you know, Andrew Brown's death was a justifiable shooting by the police. Yes, he was in his car. He was trying to get away. They said, well, he swerved, tried to use his car as a weapon at us, but he was driving away and they still (laughs) shot him in the back of the head through the rear window of the car as he was driving away. He was not aiming at anybody. The car was not being used as a weapon at that point, but they decided it was okay to open fire. Tell me you saw the video. Oh, yeah, I saw the video. No, 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 not that one. Tell me you saw the video of the old white man in in, in the F-150 pickup truck. Anybody? Nobody? Okay. I didn't see it. You an opportunity. There's a video, I believe it happened in Minnesota, of an older white man who did not want to yield to comply with police, just decided he wanted to comply with police, telling them to stop, step out of his car. No, no, he was out of his car, didn't want to comply. This guy gets into his pickup truck, backs up, bangs into another car, bangs into a car in front of him, makes a U-turn, all this with the cops around him. A cop jumps on this guy's sideboard. The guy is doing 40 down the street with a police officer hanging off of his sideboard. The cop produces a hammer to try to break the window. The old white dude takes the hammer, beats the shit out of the cop, and walks away without a scratch. Now, now, let me tell you something, okay? I tell people all the time, the racism just is not in what happens to black people. The racism is also in what doesn't happen to white folks, okay? Mm-hmm. That is a, and I, I mean, that happened like not long after, uh, uh, that, there, was, there was an incident, might have been not long after the Floyd trial, but it, after the Chauvin trial, but but go go take a look. That thing was widely distributed, it, it went viral, just because it shows you the level of privilege. You know, I've seen videos of white boys who are told to drop to the ground, who start chasing the cops. They literally start chasing, and the cops run the other way. Treat me like you treat them. You know right. what I mean? And that's that's all. Don't you don't have to murder me over a pack of Lucy cigarettes. Yeah, I don't disagree at all. I mean, well, you know, there, it, it's just it's been. I, it, it's it, just at least the, the cameras, you know, the cameras change. are going to be the saving grace in all this kind of stuff. The right. body cams, and and the thing is, I think, and here's one of the problems with that uh, Louisiana situation too. There's a bunch of instances during that where they turned off their body cameras, so we didn't see everything that happened to that guy. And that should be something that's a fireable offense right away. Turn off your body camera, you're fired, unless you can show that it was broken in some capacity. But if you don't, you know, I I, I think that's just inexcusable because the body cams are hugely important in making sure that this kind of crap stops. There, there, there's no doubt from, again, from the lawyer's perspective, it's the body cam and dash cam, it's those videos and there's audios too. That's what makes it uh, more, e- makes it easier to prosecute the police officers successfully because 
towards, you know, as I've gotten older, I've had a couple of cases with that kind of stuff. I was got lucky and the guy was found not guilty anyway, but it, it, you can't make up facts anymore. You know, that's that's the key. I mean, yeah. Chauvin, who knows what we would have heard? If you didn't have all those videos, the other officers would have come in with some bullshit. The, the witnesses on the street would have said what they said. It had been the typical thing. Well, who are you going to believe? All these brothers and sisters on the street? Or are you going to believe these white police officers? Well, they tried. Remember, remember the original statement right. after George right. Floyd's death. You know, that, oh, there was a medical incident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. choked a guy to death. Yeah. That's a medical incident, I guess. Um, but, you know, it just these two cases this week just add more, uh, you know, to this. And um, we're so far from getting this solved at this point I would, in time. I, I would think if they can put together a instructive video with all these incidents that are happening and, 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 and use them as, as training uh, for, I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. But, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of lessons to be learned from all these things that have happened, how how they could have de-escalated a lot of these things. I mean, just, you know, in, in Minnesota, when they pull a, the gun out on, you know, they pull out they pull out a gun immediately. They start at a very hostile level over a guy over a, a over a you know a twenty dollar bill of uh, you know whatever a counterfeit but bill. But you got to remember, mean, Alan. You you got to remember. It, it's still it's the mentality of the police officer. That's what needs to be fixed. It's it, videos are great, but if you've got guys like Derek Chauvin, they don't give a flying fuck about a right, video. Right. They're gonna do what they're doing because they're gonna show. Look, I'm in charge. I'm the man here. But it's, it's also you know the other the other thing, and, and you know Ira Todd, who's who's retired now from the police department, and he said it that a lot of these white officers have not been exposed to black people. And so they don't know how to interact and they're immediately fearful and they, they pull out their guns uh, and they, you know, and so there's, it, I mean, it's crazy where, you know, we, we hire cops from, you know, now, you know, you see it all the time. You see a lot of ex-military guys. I saw it in DC. You see it in a lot of police departments. A lot of ex-military guys are coming from rural areas who have had very little exposure, except in, in sometimes a wartime environment, but they've had little exposure in dealing in, in, in an urban setting. And and we're seeing how that plays out, you know. Well, I, I think that may be true in some cases, Alan, but I think in places like metropolitan Detroit, um, you know, in other big cities, you've got you know, New York City. You no, know, those, those white cops are exposed yeah. to people. So they they sure. grew up, you know, they, they know black people. They know Puerto Ricans. They know Dominicans. They're racist and, you know, they're harboring, you know, racist ideas. And there's this notion that you should be able to kill black people and get away with it. There's just this no. That's why people say black lives matter, because there is this whole notion that black life isn't quite as valuable. And so, you know, I think what we need are things like preservation of life statute to say, hey, listen, you know, I mean, unless this guy is shooting at you, you don't have a right to shoot anybody. I mean, the dude falls out. With the, I remember the Kellum case a few years ago. The boy fell out of the roof, hiding from the cops, fell out of the roof with the hammer in his hand. And they just lit him up. Just lit him up. You shouldn't be able to do that, man. You know what I mean? I mean, unless this kid is Thor, you know, I mean, there's just no excuse for shooting a man with a hammer. And it's too much of this whole, you know, you got to you got to be the perfect victim when you're black in order to try and think about getting any level of justice. That's why, you know, the, the, the Chauvin trial, I mean, the, the, the video evidence was all right there. This stuff has been happening, continues to happen off of camera. And until we do something to, to fundamentally reform policing in this country, police culture in this country, this notion that black life is not valuable, this shit's just going to keep going. Well, and, and I'll tell you what, I mean, there, there are a whole bunch of cops out there, you know, that sort of have this judge dread complex. Like it's their job to to make sure that, you know, nothing bad happens and and so they can be judge jury and executioner right there on the spot and that's just not something that that should be acceptable um in any way and and it, it takes a comic book to show us that kind of stuff i mean really she's uh all right we've got to move on uh to talk about some other things that are going on here uh, let's talk about Governor Whitmer for just a little bit. The story that will not die, of course, is this trip that she took to Florida and the costs involved and where the money came from and whether or not this company was actually allowed to charter flights. It is continuing on. And it's one of those things that, you know, as somebody that that uh, supported her more than Bill Schuette, for sure, I'm still a little disappointed that I'm dealing with this kind of thing because you want good behavior from people that you've supported in the past. This one just won't won't die. And she's handled this very, very poorly. Go ahead, Alan. 
I was going to say, she just needed to come out immediately and say, look, I, I wrongly uh, reached out to these uh, wealthy business people. They had a plane. They flew me there. I mean, and I shouldn't have done it. And it's inappropriate and it won't happen again, period. What, what, where does the story go from there? Uh, nowhere. But instead, it seems like, and maybe I'm wrong, it seems like they pieced together, they concocted this whole thing where this nonprofit is suddenly paying $27,000 for a flight, and then there's some questions of whether they can even do it, and then she's only paid for one seat, which means that they were on business, and there's no evidence anywhere of them being on business, and it just turns into this huge story or this story that just keeps... And, and it's a nothing story that she has managed to screw up. Well, and, and when you're in damage control for this long over a story, you're losing. Um, oh, for sure. You know, it's just as, <laughs> as somebody who's been on that side of things, uh, you know, you, if you're just still doing it two weeks out, three weeks out, uh, it's it's a it's problem. A month. And, I mean, and, you know, months, and you've got you've got Charlie LaDuff, you know, who's now as, as ML Elric told me about Charlie LaDuff once. He said he's like a dog with a new chew toy. He's going to pick it up and he's going to shake it around a whole bunch for a while until he gets all the stuffing out of that thing and figures out what's going on. And that's not the guy you want doing that kind of stuff. I mean, because. He will keep digging and he will keep asking questions and he'll be critical and keep the story alive for as long as he needs to. And, and that's just you've got to find a way to combat that stuff. I well, mean, it, I mean, now way, there's some other easy... pending things going on. The IRS. Now, somebody's filed a complaint with the IRS. The, uh, the Federal Aviation uh, Administration is now you know, looking into uh, whether they could have chartered a flight, whether a private own company right. can charter and all these questions and there's going to be findings even if there's negative fi findings in her favor there's going to be more stories well right. exactly and the it's findings themselves will be a story and and even even if they sit there and say say that she did nothing improper half the people out there are going to not believe it and keep it right. out there anyway i mean it's just you know you you can't win in this type of a situation she could have done better on this one and did not yeah. in the meantime this is now bringing into question some of her changes in orders to to the mask mandates and, and reopening the state of Michigan and the pressure that she's been under to do that. And a lot of people are saying, well, she's only doing this to distract from that other problem. Hey, you know, it's it's obviously a difficult time to be in politics. It always is a difficult time to be in politics. But I mean, there are things that she could be doing better. And she's now starting to lose faith amongst some of the people that supported her Um that, you know, thought maybe it was time for a change from Rick Snyder and the Republicans, but they could swing back next year. No problem. Well, depending on who the nominee is on the, on well, the GOP side. Well, but. unless unless it's that Tudor Chief Nixon, yeah. Tudor Dixon. What's her <laughs> name? Tudor, gonna be Tudor, Tudor Dixon. Dixon. Yeah, I, that's I, a great I, name. I, the like conservative personality, Tudor Dixon enters the race for governor. I was like, who, who's Tudor who's, Dixon? Who's Tudor Dixon? She's, she's, <laughs> on, she's on some network that's like one step below OAN, yeah. apparently. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, she's not quite on the Breitbart OAN level. Yeah, right, um, yeah, she's, but she's a pretender. <laughs> so I've never, I've never even heard of her. But it, I mean, you know, hey, it doesn't mean she's not uh, a smart person. I have no idea. I just never watched her stuff. But yeah, you know, I don't yeah, run in those yeah. circles. She screwed up. She definitely screwed up. She made it the biggest story. You know, I, I understand. You know, whatever ethical concerns are there, you know, she should be reprimanded. She should be fined. Whatever needs to happen, needs to happen. When twenty people credibly come forward and accuse her of sexual assault, I'll at it. <laughs> when you know, when when you can prove that she's violated the Emoluments Act every single day that she's been in office, at When 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 she calls for an insurrection, when she calls for a violent overthrow of the United States government because she didn't win something, holla at her, Okay, like you know, I, I get it. She was wrong. She should be smacked on the wrist or whatever comes with this. I am not about to not vote for Gretchen Whitmer over, you know, in favor of a clown no. like James Craig or somebody else because of something like this. And I think that if that's where we are, then we deserve the politics that we get. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, she's done a fantastic job with regard to handling, you know, handling the, the pandemic. I thought early on, you know, before that's she cut why this is so befuddling. She's done a great job handling the pandemic. She's stood up to all the criticism. And she's and this is PR 101. Yeah. I mean, this is just she's oh. she's 
it's it's like watching you know LeBron James come out and not be able to hit a simple free throw. I mean, it's just you know. But I mean, you know, you also you got Breitbart picking it up, the Washington Examiner. exactly. Well, I know, but that's and it's your it's fault. Like, but I'm also not an... going to be like you know they're trying to create this echo chamber too. You know, this ain't Watergate. You know what I mean? This ain't, no, this it's ain't not calling somebody to Ukraine. You know, pressuring them for information on Hunter. <laughs> All right, I mean, we we you know, and I, I I'm not saying because we've lived through Trump scandals. That makes everything less than that okay. I'm not trying to justify what she well, did. I, I, I will call out the hypocrisy, though, of these people suggesting that this is a huge scandal and then telling me everything I saw about Trump over the last four years was fake news. If you're one of those people, <laughs> kiss my ass, because I, really? I mean, you know, I get that she screwed up. We're talking about it, right? We're not ignoring this you know, because we like her. We're not ignoring it. We're paying attention to it and we're treating it as a real subject. Right. Unlike the Trump supporters who would just basically go, blah, 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 blah. I'm not listening to you. This is a real thing. We'll see what happens to her as a result of it. But do not sit here and get all righteous on me and sit there and say, she's corrupt. She's terrible. And you voted for Donald Trump. You're in the Enough. same party as Matt Gates. <laughs> Matt, Matt Gates. Matt Gates is, by the way, sweating a little bit these Sarah, days. Um, Sarah, what's what's your read on uh, Chief Craig running for governor? Me? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I'm no fan of his. I think that, uh, you know, I, I think he pulled a big con job on on a lot of the citizens of Detroit. You know, with the whole pay for protection project green light thing. I think you know, we look at the numbers in the neighborhoods. Um, you know, violent crime. Went up a lot, you know. We've had a lot of folks shot and killed. And he, he, I think, he did a great job of jumping in front of cameras. Uh, he's very savvy that way. Um, but I don't, I don't think that there's really much there. I think he's, I think he's, he's a showman. Um, but I don't think he knows much about policy. I don't think he cares much about policy. I certainly don't think he cares much about the fundamentals of governance in, in, a, in a in a liberal democracy. I mean, this is a guy who. You know, has tried to help to turn turn Detroit into a surveillance state. I feel like, and so you know, I am not uh, I'm not a big fan. I don't think that I think that you know, while he was chief, there are a lot of folks who you know liked him. You know, he's a telegenic guy, little cute fella with the green eyes. He jumps on camera. You know, you got people who kind of like that whole thing without even necessarily looking at policy. But I think that you know, when when the stakes go up and people really start to pay close attention to what he stands for. You know, I mean, he's an acolyte of Daryl Gates, as far as I'm concerned, really. I, I, I mean, I'm being perfectly honest. This is who he sort of cut his teeth under uh, with the LAPD. And I feel like he's brought some of that. I mean, Daryl Gates was media savvy in his own way. I think Craig's right. brought some of that to the table. I think it snowed a lot of people here in Detroit. I think that there are folks who aren't buying it. Um, but I think, unfortunately, a lot of people are. We got a lot of people who still are afraid. We got a lot of seniors. He did a great job of appealing to them. I think when the stakes go up, the electorate experience things may change. Go ahead, Nancy. Do you think? Do you think that there is any hay to be made out of the fact that he's lived here for what five years, eight years, something like that? I mean, you know, he's kind of a he's he's a careerist. He's followed his his career around the country. He spent an awful lot of time in California. Then he was in what Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Yeah, exactly. It's like what. What is it about Michigan that makes you want to be chief executive of, you know, it, it, I don't understand his motivation for wanting to be governor. I mean, I don't see the skill set of being wh the, whoever was somebody on this show who said he's trying to become a Fox News, a regular yeah. Fox News. I, th I think I think that's why he's doing I, this. Personally, I that's what I happened. think. But, but I, th I think his I think his original goal was to be mayor. And they made him deputy mayor. I think they were going to try to slide him into that uh, mayor's spot. But then Duggan decided to run again. So that was shut down. And so I think he needs he doesn't want to be a Congress member because he wants to be the boss. He doesn't want to be one of 435. I'll tell you we don't that. need another person in an office like that who thinks that when you that you are the boss okay you are not the boss well, and, and as gretchen whitmer can attest right now we have just being the boss and it doesn't mean you're going to get anything done that you want to get done and and exactly. you know i had a conversation a long time ago with with mike duggan about this when he first uh, became mayor and you know people are asking him all the time well are you going to run for governor are you going to run for governor and he told me he's like why would I want that job? You basically have the entire legislature that's gunning for you. And with things gerrymandered the way that they are in the state right now, you're not going to get any cooperation as a Democrat on anything that you want to do. He's like, you have very little power to actually affect change. Yes. Whereas if you're a mayor in a city like Detroit, which is a very strong mayoral system, you can actually, there goes my umbrella. 
you can actually make change um, and, and, you know, affect people's lives in a way that you can't as governor. I mean, right. it just it's a crappy, thankless job. And I, no, I personally would never want that job. No more brand builders. OK, I'm done with brand building as I mean, with politics as a stepping stone to a career of fabulous me. You know what I mean? I'm just stunned. I mean, that was that was Trump's play, and he won. Say, and Donald Trump on his way to his office. Exactly, and we're all paying for it, and we're going to be paying for it for many years. Well, we, we, we certainly are are still dealing with the uh, the after effects of of the pandemic response. Um, mm-hmm. So let's switch topics while we have a few minutes left. Uh, the rules are changing here in Michigan. Uh, we're going to get ready to open up. It looks like we'll be able to do whatever we want come July. Uh, granted, there's a whole bunch of people that have been doing that all along anyway. Um, but what does everybody think about that? I mean, are you feeling secure? I, we're all vaccinated, I assume. At least I know I am. Um, I'm feeling a little bit better about going out and doing things, but I still bring my mask with me just yeah. in case the stores have rules and places do. Uh, but I'm, you I'm know, sure. I did a face-to-face interview this week for the first time in a year, more than a year. And I told, and I walked in and I said, I'm fully vaccinated. Do you want me to wear a mask? And it was no. And I, so we, it was full speed ahead. And I think that's the way it's going to be going forward. And I think we should all pack our masks when we leave. It's, we should think of it as our keys, you know, and, and take it with us where we go and wear them when we're asked. That's just the way it is. I mean, I think, I think the uh, there's still the numbers are whatever, 1300 a day, 1400. There's, you know, 60, 70 people dying. The numbers still aren't where they should be. Uh, and I think we have to be careful. And, I, and, and it concerns me that I mean, the 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 upside is the efficacy rate is so much higher than the flu shot, which is right. great. Uh, but but the downside is that there are so many people who are still refusing to take it. That get, leaves a home for the virus. And not only leaves a home, but it leaves a home for the virus to mutate into some tougher variants and stuff like that. So I, I'm a little bit, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful I've got the shot. I feel a little more comfortable, but I'm still wearing a mask. And I, I've been in a restaurant once inside and it was circumstances, whatever. But we, I, I'm just taking hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm back. Hey, zinc. You know, I, I went with my, my 75. Listen, my 75 year old mom can go get vaccinated. I tell people all the time, you know, you can go and get yourself vaccinated. I mean, it's something that we need to be doing. I, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little dismayed by how the CDC kind of rolled out these these new guidelines. Um, I agree. You know, you know, if, if if this period has told us anything, it's that we've got a lot of dishonorable people. So you can't really have an honor system when you've got you know, that many kind of dishonorable folks out there. Um, but I do think I mean, I, you know, it is it, it, I, I trust the science. And, um, you know, I, I you know, I tell people Dr. Fauci is my doctor. I, I, I listen to what he's got to say. And so, you know, I do think that we should feel more optimistic. I think that there's reason for that. Sure. Um, I think we got to continue to be cautious, though. You don't know who you're dealing with out there. And, you know, I mean, you know, I don't I don't see any problem with continuing to wear your mask in certain situations. Well, you know, I think and, and, interestingly enough, I mean, I just got a, a notice from the uh, Detroit Regional Chamber because I, I usually attend the, the Mackinac Conference. It's happening in September this year that said, hey, proof of vaccination required if you're going to be attending the conference this year. And I was like, I was on the fence about going. Now I think I want to go. Um I, I think this is hilarious. I just, well, I just think that is hilarious. And if it pushes, I, I think Sue Demas had a great tweet about this yesterday afternoon, where she said it would not surprise her if to learn that a parallel freedom conference is going to uh, is going to emerge. It'll be like the Mackinac Freedom Conference. It'll probably be held on you know on the other side of the bridge, some in some freedom country or county up there in the U.S. Well, well, remember, Michonne Maddock, of course, uh, yeah. did say the other day in a tweet that maybe it's time for Michigan to secede from the union. Ugh. So, you know, well, they're already her. planning it. Maybe they're already planning it. She can move to Mississippi. That comes <laughs> to go. <laughs> right I, in, you know? Yeah, I, I know. I, I didn't understand the, it. With but. respect to the vaccine, I, I'll tell you this. Uh, my wife and I were vaccinated because we're old. We were vaccinated early in February, maybe 10th or 12th of February. And I have to tell you from, from my perspective, and I think she's pretty much the same, I, I trust the science entirely. And I've had no problem. I've worn masks in the gym every day until this week, all of a sudden, by the way, they had a sign 
If you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear it. I don't have any problem wearing a mask in, in stores anywhere where they want you to wear one. But in all honesty, I trust the science entirely. We've been on a plane. Now my wife's been a couple times. We just came back from, we'll talk about that in a second, hopefully. Yes, we will. Connecticut. Uh, and we're going to London to, uh, it, in the middle of June, towards the end of June. I, I think if you're vaccinated, you're fine. What, what gets me the most, particularly maybe for people of our age group, I haven't seen any evidence at all that if you catch it after you're vaccinated, it's going to kill you. You're going to be sick. Okay. You tell me when I can be confident I won't get the flu or a cold or something else. People are a little bit too uh, demanding in the sense of, you know, they, they think they're going to be able to walk around for the rest of their life and not be sick unless they have, are from Krypton or something. I don't see how that's going to happen. So to <laughs> yeah. me, I wish I had as much faith in my fellow Michiganian as it has we do nothing, Nancy, in the it has vaccine. nothing to do with that. I, oh, that's different. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking <laughs> about how the, the, the you're, I, I don't give a shit about the the rest of them. If they want to all not get vaccinated, that's fine. If it were up to me, I'd be in favor of a vaccine passport everywhere. Yeah. Quite frankly, but you know, God forbid, you can't even take people's guns, right? Right. If everybody should have a pistol, like Gil Scott Heron worried about 40 years ago. <laughs> now we have it, right? Uh, so, you know, that's the All way right. I go with the vaccine. All right. Well, we, we've got about 10 minutes left. So, and now it's time for Deadline Detroit's nominees for Schmuck, Schmuck of, the of, week. of the Week. Schmuck of the Week nominees. Now, I know I had one at the beginning of the program, but I actually had like three I wanted to get to today. So I'm going to start with one of my two that I want to get to uh, because I think they're, they're kind of important. Uh, my first one is uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill's Huston School of Journalism. Now, they had offered a tenured position um, uh, to a very, very qualified journalist, Nicole Hammonds. She has won Arthur Fellowship Genius Grant. She's also been awarded the Pulitzer Prize. She worked on the 1619 Project, and she graduated from the University of North Carolina. They were going to offer her a tenured position, and then they yanked it because the conservative members on the school's board didn't like the fact that she worked on the 1619 Project. And they came up with some bullshit excuse saying, well, she doesn't have enough background in academia. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, she's got a master's degree in journalism from your school. She's one of you. And of course, she got a MacArthur's Genius Grant. And she's one of your own. <laughs> and you have a good position. And so... Uh, th- I'm, I'm sorry, the schmuckitude level there is high because people are afraid to actually look at the ghosts of our past. She didn't just work I, on that project. That was her project. I, I, I realize, I realize that, but I mean, you know, the fact is, it's, yeah. it, it is yeah. a scholarly work. It is important. And she is somebody that a lot of students look up to, and she would be a great addition to that staff. She really would. Cry and babies. The, the academia. The cry babies is all it the, is. The oh. academia. I once applied. I was at the Washington Post and I applied for a full time job. And I can't remember if it was University of Detroit or University of New Mexico. One of the two. And so they said, well, what do you I'm have? easily confused. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's been so long. But and, and, and the head of the department said, well, do you have a Ph.D.? I said, no, I have an undergrad. But I said, I worked at Detroit News. I'm at the Washington Post. I said, Tell me, what could somebody with a Ph.D. possibly know more about journalism than me, who's been in academia, you know, and, I, I, and she couldn't answer. She just said, well, that's what they want. So it's, it's yeah. a ridiculous. Uh, Thank you for that update from your career. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, though, I, I thought that was, I thought that was worthy. I mean, just, just absolute cowards worried about the conservative backlash on yeah. this one. And, and that's all it is, because, you know. Uh, I, I, I hope she turns it down because they're saying, well, we want you on the faculty, just not tenured. They wouldn't give her a five-year contract. Well, and exactly. And, in and five I think, years, it'll but be... They, they would have yeah. everybody else before, and then like, well, we've got to rethink this policy now. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. She made you uncomfortable. Exactly. That's what's supposed to happen in university settings. Yeah. All right, who wants to go next? Go Nancy. Next. Nancy, Nancy goes go. next. All right, I'm giving mine this week to Mark McCloskey who, if the name does not ring a bell, um, you probably remember him from last summer standing in front of his lavishly over-decorated St. Louis mansion with his uh, wife with a mustard stain on her shirt uh, yep. holding an AR-15. I tweeted about him Because yesterday. some people that they didn't like were walking past their um, their mansion, their over-decorated mansion. And the, um, 
and and on the one hand, I have to say, at least he's a lawyer. At least he has an understanding <laughs> of what policy is and what lawmaking is because he's a lawyer. But at the same time, it, this is more brand building. And, uh, and no, he's, he's going to run for he's going to he's announced to run for Senate from the, no. the great state of Missouri, state of my birth. Go figure. So Mark, and that's a good one. That's a good one. And, and yeah. he, he really looked good holding that AR with his pink polo shirt on. Yeah. And the, and the little, I love pink shirts. I have a great. bunch of and, them, and but her waving it's not that my typical pistol, hunting gear. Yes. Yeah, exactly. She was like, so anyway, she was good. Uh, yeah. Steve Fishman. Well, I have four, but I don't have four different ones. I have four schmucks of the week and they're all males and they all serve on the United States Supreme court. Mr. Rolito, uh, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Gorsuch and Mr. Kavanaugh for deciding they would take on this case from Mississippi and leaving most of us, a lot of us, to believe they're going to reverse Roe versus Wade. Yep. Yep. Uh, the notion, and I don't need to make the speech, everybody knows the speech and I'm not female, but the notion that these four guys, I'm not even talking about the female justice that got, in, got appointed, they've been banging the drum about this for all this time and it's just beyond my comprehension that men let alone people who claim to be educated from Ivy League schools, think they have the right to tell females what they can do with their own body. Well, could you put Greg Abbott on that list, too, from Texas? Well, Greg Abbott, he, he, these guys, the reason I picked them, Abbott is just another asshole politician. These are supposed to be smart people who come from great backgrounds and, you know, have been on the Supreme Court, blah, blah, blah. For them to pull a stunt like this, they're my schmucks of the week. Ooh, I, thank I you. I think that's a pretty good one. And, the female uh, you know, thanks you. So, yeah. uh, Daryl Dossie, who do you have as a schmuck of the week? Yeah, those, those are some good ones, actually. Um, I was thinking about them UNC as well. But I think I'll have to go with the DPD. Um, there's a story out today about how Detroit police are firing their guns uh, more substantially than before during arrests. And that is something that, you know, to the points that we were making a little bit earlier, that we just have to stop. Um, this just has to end, this whole notion that, you know, you, that every time there's a problem, you got a right to just, you know, pull out your gun and shoot somebody as a way of solving it. Um, you know, I don't, I, I know that being a police officer can be a dangerous job. I mean, statistics, though, it's not the most dangerous job. It's like 42 or whatever, but still, okay, I understand. So, but I, I just think that there's got to be a better way. Um, there's got to be real reform. And these numbers are very disturbing. And this is not the trend that Detroit needs to be going in. It's not the direction we should be going in. And somebody was asking me about James Craig, folks like that. I think those folks are primarily responsible for helping to entrench a culture that produces outcomes like this. So that All makes- right. That's a good one, Daryl. Alan Langle. I am going to pick two schmucks of the week together in tandem uh, because uh, – Drum roll, please, Nancy. Uh, <laughs> I am going to pick uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas. Mm-hmm. I think together, uh, I mean, Netanyahu, uh, as I say, never misses an opportunity to poke the Arabs in the eye. And Hamas is a horrible partner in peace. They will they refuse to recognize Israel, and there's no starting point with either one. And they're both really a product of of frustrations from both people. I mean, the you know, the Intifada came after Rabin and, and Barack and and buses were being blown up and people were frustrated. They went they turned to Netanyahu, who does not want peace. And then the same thing with Fatah. People got frustrated, the Palestinians got frustrated. They wanted a tougher response to Israel and they came up with Hamas and we see uh, a horrible situation just playing out again. And it's just going to keep playing out until somebody breaks the uh, whatever, the, the course of action here. Well, I mean, a ceasefire we'll today, forever. a positive development, and let's hope it sticks. Um, all right. So I've got one more uh, that, I, that I want to get to just because I, I read this and I was just like, OK, what, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Ron DeSantis is my schmuck of the week uh. because he negotiated a deal with the Seminole Indian tribe. They have refusal rights to any other casinos near their casino, the Hollywood casino that they own down there in Miami Beach or wherever it is. They can basically reject other ones. So he makes a deal to get them some more funding. In exchange, they agreed not to stand in the way of a possible casino for none other than Donald Trump on the grounds of his Doral property in Miami, which has been struggling mightily, uh, as many of his golf properties are. But I'm thinking to myself, what moron 
thinks it's a good idea to give a man who's bankrupted three casinos already <laughs> back when there was no competition. <laughs> And Come he's on. Gonna be a good one. I mean, there's no way this guy would have passed muster for the casino licenses when they went through this all in Detroit. You remember that? How difficult that was for everybody to get cleared? Yeah. Donald Trump has bankrupted the Taj Mahal. Uh, the, the other MAGA, ones that he had. The MAGA people will go to that Donald Trump casino and they won't even bother putting their money down for chips. Just give it to they're, just, they're just going to give it to them. Exactly. It's like, but, it's an honor, sir. It's an honor, sir. But but who's like sitting there going, oh, he seems like a good businessman. <laughs> I mean, Fortunately. the guy's bankrupted three casinos, and yeah. they're going to give him a license for another one in Florida. Oh, great. How do you do that? That's but amazing. the only positive, if he does get this casino license, then I guarantee you he's not going to run for president. So maybe we should yeah. just do this, and that's he's for good. He's not going to run everybody. for president anyway. Letitia James going to lock his ass up. Right? <laughs> well, let's, let's hope. All right. All right. Well, we've got to wrap things up. Before we do, though, I want to give Steve a second here. Um, the Basketball Hall of Fame induction ceremony was uh, this past weekend. It was announced that, uh, of course, Chris Weber uh, got in from the University of Michigan, but so did one Rudy Tomjanovich. Uh, Steve, you had a chance to get out there and see him, didn't you? We did. Webb Web and Ben Wallace are going in next year, but uh, oh, next year that's it right. Was, it was quite a quite a weekend. Unbelievably, the six seniors from our Michigan team of graduating 1969-70 are all still alive and healthy enough to go. We all attended, and all of our wives went. And I have to say, it was one of the great experiences. There are not very many people. Daryl knows from being an athlete himself. You don't get a chance to play in college with too many people to wind up in the Basketball or Football Hall of Fame. And to sit there and see Isaiah and Julius Irving and Alonzo Mourning and, you know, Akeem Olajuwon, all these unbelievable players, and you realize that your teammate, uh, he's, he's the only one ever that won 500 games as a coach and two NBA titles and also scored more than 10,000 points in the league, which is 3,000 less than he actually went for. Uh, so it, it was a fantastic thing. Uh, we have so much negatives, as we've been discussing for an hour. Uh, we really just sat back and relaxed and enjoyed it. And all those memories of 55, 50 years ago washed over us as we watch a Rudy up there. Here's a kid from Hamtramck High School. Did not have a telephone in his house. Didn't have a driver's license till he signed his contract with the NBA. And here awesome. he is in the Basketball Hall of Fame. That's what it's supposed to be all about. So, yeah, he, he was, cool. uh, you know, I knew him mostly as a coach, obviously, but, uh, you know, what a phenomenal player he was as well and uh, well-deserved for him. And it's, he, it, it was just it well, was great one, to see. One, one thing for sure, in addition to being able to shoot it, people always thought, you know, they made that movie, White Men Can't Jump. And when he was coaching, one of the young reporters asked him about, oh, coach, have you seen the movie? And he said, no. He said, well, we thought maybe they made it after you. And he looked at him and anybody that ever played against or with him, he said, you must have never seen me play. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you, Steve. We appreciate uh, you being with us once again. And uh, hey, maybe I'll see you Monday afternoon. We're going to be across the street with a couple of folks. So, uh, you know, after work and uh, maybe we'll see you there. You that's, never know. That's not a bad idea. All right. We'll see you there for sure. It's been a long yeah. time in person. So, uh, Steve Fishman, thank you. Daryl Dossie, always appreciate having you here, sir. Thanks for your insights. And um, we'll have you back soon. Fish, man. I appreciate that. That's right. <laughs> of course. Man, of course. <laughs> Nancy Derringer, thank you as always. We appreciate it. Alan Langell. We appreciate you as well, sir. Thanks Thank to Michael you. Lucido for engineering the broadcast today. We always do appreciate that. Thanks to Lynette Shrimp House for sponsoring this program and for sponsoring Deadline Detroit. And you, too, can become a member at Deadline Detroit for just $3 a month. Go to Deadline Detroit slash membership. Look into it. Support this little ragtag bunch of journalists who are scrapping hard these days and putting out some pretty good stories. There's some great stuff that is up on the site right now that you should check out um, every day, as a matter of fact. There's really good stuff up there. So we appreciate all of you. Have a wonderful weekend. And for at least one more week, Alan. Stay home safely. <laughs> <laughs> The Craig Fawley Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings, alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu, like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway, noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's.